Hi there, I'm Reverend Jim Burklow, Senior Associate Dean of Religious and Spiritual Life at the University of Southern California, and welcoming you to the second session of our exploration into Christian contemplative practices. In our first session, we got an overview and some experience with these practices, and this time we're going to go deeper. I want to introduce you to some mindfulness practices that I have found very helpful in preparing me for contemplative prayer. So I'll walk you through them, and then you can pause the video to practice them. Enter the prophet Elijah's cave, if you will, and get into a comfortable physical position and be aware of your body. What sensations do you experience in the moment? What emotions are associated with these sensations, and how do they affect your breathing? Are you experiencing any pain, and what's the nature of the pain, the exact location from which it radiates? Suffering equals pain times resistance. So if you drop the resistance and let the pain be as it is, observe it carefully and stay open to it and surround it with loving attention and gently abandon your ideas and narratives around it, you'll have a different relationship to your pain that may involve less suffering. Contemplative prayer changes the meaning of our pain. It releases, our, it releases us from identifying ourselves with this pain. It just lets it be what it is without us being caught up in a storyline that amplifies it. It gives us from a certain kind of detachment from pain that relieves and redeems suffering. Something that can help with this is progressive muscle relaxation. And that's where you tighten and then release muscle groups in your body one at a time. Start with your feet and move all the way up to your head. Tightening and releasing. Being attentive to the sensations you experience as a result. As part of your practice, also try urge surfing. When you feel an urge to take an action or to solve a problem, uh, give a little time. Explore it a bit before uh, acting on it. Let the urge be. Delay acting on it and uh, just long enough to fully experience it. Where does the urge manifest in the body? What emotions go with this urge? What does the urge feel like? Write it out for a while. See what it happens as, as a result. Next, focus on emotions that arise and on the ways that they manifest in your body and in your breath. We have emotions all the time. This discipline involves observing them. When one arises, watch it with high resolution perception. Observe the emotion and its effects on the body. And observe it with openness and warmth, with agape love, unconditional love. The love that is God. Let it play out naturally and then let it pass in its own time. As we move deeper into contemplation, we move from saying, I am sad, to I feel sadness. That is, we stop identifying ourselves with our experiences. How long does it take you to move from sensing an emotion to observing it in a conscious way, thus recognizing the distinction that it has from your core identity? For example, you become conscious that you're anxious, in that moment, you can look back and recall when the emotion of anxiety actually began and how it manifested in your body. In that gap of time between experiencing an emotion and becoming consciously aware of it, suffering and confusion can multiply. One of the fruits of contemplative practice is shortening this time gap, giving us more control over the way that we respond to our emotions. As St. Paul said in his letter to the Ephesians, be angry, but do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. Next, in silent practice, turn your attention to someone you love very much. 
direct your love toward that person and savor and investigate the experience of it. How does it feel to give this person, in your imagination, the attention that is love? Where does the love reside in the body? How does it affect your breathing? How does it express itself emotionally? Then turn your attention to a person you don't know well at all and direct love toward that person and investigate the experience. Then turn it toward the whole human race, the whole planet, and do the same. Then turn it toward yourself and do the same. Pay attention with agape love toward yourself. That's the hard part for most of us. We're so much easier on others than we are on ourselves. But learning the discipline of deep self-compassion also opens up the tap of love for others. And again, as you go deeper in self-compassion, you'll begin to discover that your true self is not your body, your thoughts, emotions, personality, roles in the world, or anything else that you can observe. Your true self is God, who is the loving attention that does the observing of all the things that ordinarily we associate with who we are. This is the moment of discovery, the moment that St. Jo- St. Paul described in his letter to the Galatians when he said, it is no longer I who live, but it is Christ who lives in me. Next, focus on your thoughts. What are the colors, textures, tones, and qualities of your thoughts? Which ones are sticky? Which ones pass quickly? And what form do your thoughts take? Are they voices? images? What emotions are associated with them? And where do these emotions manifest in your body? Thoughts spin around problems that we're anxious to fix. This can pose a challenge as we lose attention to the problem by becoming absorbed in problem solving, which leads to the experience of getting stuck. But contemplating the problem itself, just looking at the problem, as it is in itself, rather than trying to solve it right away, has the paradoxical effect of opening up a fresh awareness of the peripheral realm around the problem, in which solutions might be found. And isn't that the essence of holy awe itself, being absorbed with appreciative attention by something that's beyond your mind's ability to grasp or manage? Contemplate the problem itself with loving, patient focus, and gently let the solution emerge in its own time. Richard of St. Victor understood this practice as a teacher of monks in the 12th century. He said, thinking always passes from one thing to another by a wandering motion. Meditation endeavors perseveringly with regard to some one thing. Contemplation diffuses itself to innumerable things under one ray of vision. Spiritual practice moves between and among these forms of attention. One pointed focus yields to a wide peripheral vision, a sense of the wholeness and the unity of all. By compassionately, carefully observing the smallest things, mere mustard seeds of thought or emotion or sensation, we're able to apprehend the bigger picture of our lives. In contemplative prayer, Wanting equals having. To pay attention to our desire for progress and contemplation is to have a taste of that progress. The anonymous author of the 14th century classic of Christian spirituality, The Cloud of Unknowing, wrote these words. The will only needs a brief fraction of a moment to move forward toward the object of its desire. The aptitude for this work is one with the work. They are identical. You possess it to the extent that you will that you will and desire to possess it. No more and no less. Think of it. What other endeavor in life is so wonderful that the mere desire for it satisfies that desire on the spot? So savor your desire for this progress as its own experience in the moment. Let it be a mustard seed that you can trust to grow in its own time and on its own terms. 
Contemplative practice trains us to trust that our awareness of a problem or, our, or of a need for growth in some way will activate our inner creativity and capacity for change. We don't need to solve problems or fix things in contemplative practice. We learn to have faith that solutions will arise from within when the time is right. As Thomas Merton, the 20th century Trappist Catholic monk, summarized, in prayer, we already we discover what we already have. You start where you are and you deepen what you already have and you realize that you're already there. We already have everything, but we don't know it and we don't experience it. Everything has been given to us in Christ. All we need is to experience what we already possess. So attend to all that arises bodily sensations, mental and physical urges, the rhythm of your breath, your emotions, your thoughts, directing divine love toward these experiences. Stay open and accepting toward them, releasing them as they pass in their own time and on their own terms. If you lose attention in your contemplation, pay attention to that. Everything and anything can be the focus of your attention even the lack of focus. So, with these seeds for con contemplation, these uh, mindfulness practices that will prepare you to go deeper in contemplation, pause the video and for 10 minutes enter into contemplatio. St. Paul challenged Christians to pray without ceasing. In an anonymous 19th century Russian lay monk did just that, with remarkable consequences for his life and the lives of those he touched. He wrote The Way of the Pilgrim, which is one of the great classics of Christian spirituality. He took St. Paul's words to heart, and he recited what is known as the Jesus Prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy upon me, a sinner. He used it as the Hindus would employ a mantra repeating it so much and so often that it became a subconscious hum that constantly permeated his life. His book is a testament to the effects of this spiritual practice. It turned him into a gifted listener. As he wandered around Russia, he was able to serve many people as a kind of spiritual midwife, enabling personal transformations, reconciling conflicts, and inspiring acts of charity. This practice is integral to the Philokalia, the foundational text for Eastern Orthodox Christian spirituality. The pilgrim repeated a verbal prayer that became a silent prayer that went deeper than its own words, transforming it into an attitude of deeply humble receptivity. It was a verbal prayer that transmuted into a prayer of listening. So try it now. Pause this video and repeat aloud for five minutes, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy upon me. Then for five more minutes, repeat it in your mind over and over. Then for five more minutes, cease the con conscious repetition and let the Jesus prayer echo within you. See what happens. What was that like for you? Do you still hear the prayer silently repeating within you, deep within? Practicing deep silence has been at the heart of Christian contemplation since its beginning. The biblical Greek word for spirit was pneuma, breath. One powerful practice of contemplative Christian prayer is to focus on the breath, simply being attentive of the air flowing into us and out of us is a great way to start paying attention to all else that comes to consciousness in the here and the now. No words are necessary to associate with these sighs. The sigh is too deep for words that St. Paul talked about. So it is with prayer. The expression and the impression of it are one process. One naturally flows into the other. You try to locate in space and time the point between breathing in and breathing out. 
you'll get lost in a conundrum. The now is not a fixed point, but rather the present awareness of a flow that never stops. Talking to God and listening to God are aspects of one continuous flow of relationship of our small s selves with the capital S self in which we interexist with all beings. We pray with words. We are answered with the word, which transcends human language. As it says in the beginning of the book of John, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. The word inspires words, and in turn, those words are completed and rendered silent before the word. The Quakers, also known as the Society of Friends, represent a Christian tradition that focuses much more on listening than on talking, on asking questions more than on pronouncing answers. They deliberate about important matters for their community by drafting queries or questions. In their meeting houses, Quakers sit in silence and let those queries sink deep into their hearts. So try this Quaker practice yourself. Make a query, ask a question of yourself. It can be about a personal choice or decision or a matter of conscience that you're wrestling with. Say it aloud and then repeat it in silence and then simply wait upon the Lord in silence. Let go of any expectation of an answer. Just sit with the question. Let it sink in meditatio into your heart. Let it percolate down into you until it is swallowed up by the silence of your contemplatio with divine love. Do this for 15 minutes a day until you get what the Quakers call clearness about the question. That can take the form of a clear answer or it can take the form of being clear that you need to sit with a question, the question for a lot longer. In my own experience, the best thing I can do for my friends is to listen to them. If I'm doing too much of the talking, then I'm not adequately listening. And when I listen, I do best if I really listen by being present in silence, asking a few strategic questions, and if I give my friend full, compassionate, agape love, truly interested attention. The fourth century Christian mystic Gregory of Nyssa said that we consider becoming God's friend the one thing, the only one thing, worthy of honor and desire. Contemplative prayer is being God's friend and letting God be a friend to us, simply being attentively with each other's being. And so I commend this practice to you. Next time you are with someone who needs your attention, give it to them with deep intention to listen fully, let go of your opinions, let go of your urge to give advice and judgment. Make the conscious effort to be with and let be. Listening with agape love to another person is a powerful form of Christian contemplation in which it is no longer I who lives, but it is Christ who lives within me and through me. The cross is the central symbol of the Christian faith. On it, Jesus was executed by occupying Romans for inciting the Jewish people to rebellion. The cross marks our most depraved inhumanity and at the same time aims toward the divine love that redeems our humanity. So let us contemplate the cross right now as Christians have been doing for 2,000 years. I am a mirror to those who know me. This human passion which I am about to suffer is your own, sang Jesus in the early Christian text, The Round Dance of the Cross. The great scholar of early Christianity, Elaine Pagels, wrote, in the round dance of the cross, Jesus says that he suffers in order to reveal the nature of human suffering and to teach the paradox that the Buddha also taught, that those who become aware of their suffering simultaneously find release from it. Jesus in the Gospel of John said, And just as Moses 
lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. The people of Israel during their exodus from Egypt suffered from snake bites, and the cure that God offered was for them to, look, to gaze at a bronze serpent. The Gospel of John offers a parallel interpretation of the cross on which Jesus was ex executed. The image of Jesus on the cross mirrors our own suffering. Gazing at it is a contemplative practice that is a homeopathic cure for the human condition of suffering. The culture around us tells us that pain is to be avoided, masked, drugged, denied. It tells us that life is about ever bigger and ever better things, the upward trail of material progress. But Christianity is wildly countercultural. The cross tells us something completely different. The human life is about loving each other through our inevitable pain. Gaze at the cross and focus on its center, the place of the heart of the suffering Christ. Notice your own sufferings as well as those of others around you, the people in the wider world. Name them. Pain, unfulfilled desire, existential emptiness, frustrated ambition, anger, resentment, fear, oppression, poverty, pestilence, war, as you gaze squarely at the intersecting point of the cross. This is your reality, and the reality of the human race of which you are a part. This is the reality of the crucified Christ. The Christ, which is the human encounter with God, is fully and compassionately present in every pang of misery that you and other human beings experience. When you are fully conscious of the true extent of your suffering and that of others, pull back your gaze and notice the cross as a whole. Its arms point out in the four directions. There is life on the other side of suffering and even of death. This too is the human condition, the experience of going through suffering, and finding an eternal kind of life beyond it in this life. I see the cross as a compass, north, south, east, west, converging at a point, and through that center point of the cross, I take aim at how I want to be and where I want to go. It aims me at divine consciousness. It aims me at kindness. It aims me at compassion. It aims me at knowing the knowing. I can sit in church and spend the whole worship service just staring at the cross and being absorbed with these aims. I make images of the cross as a spiritual practice, and I invite you to create or get one of your own, one that speaks most directly to you. The cross has many depictions. Some are ornate, some are very simple, some display the suffering body of the Christ, others are just the shape of the cross itself. The one that speaks to me is a circle with a simple equilateral cross inside of it. Choose the cross that speaks to you best, put it before you, and use it for a visio divina. First gaze at it and let it be what it is as it is. Let your seeing of it be a meditatio. Let the sight of it percolate into your soul without preconditions or assignations of meaning. Then close your eyes in contemplatio and wait for the echo of the meditatio. What follows your gaze? What arises? Observe and know until you awaken to the knower within. Pause the video and practice for 10 minutes. A crash is a set of figurines depicting the birth of Jesus. Mary, Joseph, shepherds, wise men from the east, and angels, all contemplating the baby Jesus in a manger. You could hardly call them action figures. <laughs> Rather, they're looking figures. Not just looking, but just looking. My daily prayer practice aims at the same experience. Most of the time, if I'm looking at all, I'm looking for something, looking up something, looking into something. Most of my looking has an agenda. 
It has preconditions, prejudices, and assumptions. There's something I want, and I'm using my senses to find it. Looking without preconditions, looking without the intention of seeing any particular thing in a certain way, looking only for the sake of looking, that is a very different experience. Every day I walk at least three miles, aiming to take a God's eye view of all that is present within and around me. I love rocks, fossils, native plants, grand vistas. I find myself looking for these things along the steep trail, and that quest has its own charms and satisfactions. But far greater and deeper is the satisfaction of observing this impulse to look for, and then letting it go and focusing on just looking looking without any purpose or goal or aim, just observing what is as it is in the moment that it is, and then moving on and just looking at what is next as it is in the moment that it is, without naming or describing or presuming anything about what it is, and then being aware that the one within me who looks is beyond observation, liberated from temporality and judgment and opinion and evaluation and description. This kind of looking leads to awe and wonder and discovery. It's the wellspring of creativity. It makes us possible to see human needs that might otherwise have escaped our everyday attention. After a while of practicing this way of looking, I begin to appreciate what I was seeing on its own terms, not just my own. I enter into visio divina, divine seeing. Such is the looking of the figures in the crash scene of the birth of Jesus. The crash is a window into the eternal quality of the now, an icon of the divine point of view. It is slack-jawed, timeless, aimless, free, worshipful awe that is love that is God. Maybe the wise men came to Bethlehem looking for the newborn king, but when they got there and laid down their gifts, I like to think that they ended that quest and just looked at the baby lying in the hay without believing anything about him, without assuming anything about him, without defining him. Just looking with full attention, total presence, pure love. So too, the shepherds looked. They had been keeping watch over their sheep. Then they were keeping watch over Jesus, just looking. So it was with the angels who are present in the story of Christmas. The biblical word in Greek for angel means messenger, someone who reports on what is, as it is, not on what it's supposed to be, not on what we wish it was. Angels watch over. They just look and then report what they see. The Greek word for gospel is related, evangelion, or good message. The gospel is what we see when we just look at what is, as it is, where and when it is, without filters or interpretations or preconceptions. Abba Bessarion, one of the early Christian desert fathers who spent their lives in contemplative prayer in the wilderness, op he offered up this admonition on his deathbed. The monk should be all I, like the cherubim and the seraphim. It's an epiphany, biblical Greek word for a sudden appearance or manifestation, to discover the difference between looking for and just looking. When I'm just looking, I can see an incarnation of God that I might miss when I'm looking for. And that incarnation is what we celebrate at Christmas. So I invite you to join me in this spiritual practice of Visio Divina. Get a crash or a picture of one. And join the angels. Join the shepherds and the wise men and the parents in just looking at the baby Jesus for several minutes in meditatio. Then in contemplatio, Close your eyes and wait for the echo of that meditatio. What emerges? We've come to the end of this video. 
So you can pause the video now to gaze at this crush image and engage in this practice.